Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the return of the Athletic Fantasy Football Podcast. We are back. Our two-week break after the Super Bowl has come to an end, and we are ready to turn the calendar over to 2021. Of course, the NFL will be doing the same in, what, about three weeks or so. The new league year begins on March 17th, and it begins with free agency, which is exactly what we are going to be focusing on on this episode of the Athletic Fantasy Football Podcast. You've had a few weeks off from us, and I've had a few weeks off from these two guys, Jake Seeley and Brandon Funston. We are back together here. How have the last few weeks been, you guys? I've missed talking to you like this. <laughs> You sure have you, you really? Yeah, have you really? yeah of are course. You honest? <laughs> I am. I am. I, I am very sincere when I say that. Very genuine. Very earnest. I love talking to you guys. And you know, we need some time apart, I suppose. Who doesn't? But two weeks was good for me. I'm really happy to be looking at your guys' faces and talking to you again here. Yeah, and like, yeah. It's not like there's been like something to talk about for the last two weeks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think uh, I think we could have kept going, and there would have been plenty. I think the NFL news cycle has kept things uh, pretty well primed for us, so we got a lot to catch up on for sure. Yeah, we do, Jake. What have you been up to these last couple of weeks? Uh, trying to get some time off and not getting it. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> but those vacation days I was ready, ready to take never happened because we got our fancy baseball draft get coming out as fun to knows and yeah, so you know. maybe maybe next week i'll get a day off or two but last week we did the the pit i don't know were you on it bell or did you do the pitchers list thing were you on that one too i did the uh the the uh pitch con pitch con yes i was part of pitch con i talked yeah, so uh, 2021 I, sleepers and busts i had that and then i got two people asking me to do a podcast it's always the same week i like have a week off and it's like hey you want to do a guest spot hey you want to do a guest spot hey you want to do pitch con and then all of a sudden it's a full week so i still not complaining everybody still love the job just i i do need a day eventually i told you i'm, I'm actually concerned i might have the COVID. so let's let's make sure you're the you're the, pray, you're pray the bell of the ball happen. jake you're the you're the prettiest girl at the dance you should be That's flattered by all that attention <laughs> <laughs> yeah until they meet me in real part, real life <laughs> yeah yeah well we know all about that and we, hey, we've gotten to uh, i guess that's something you've been able to do the last few weeks right uh, uh expose the world to some more dating fails which has been fun to follow along with yeah um sadly no i say yeah i'll have to listen to chris meany and myself talk about the misery of that i'll just <laughs> i'll give you a sneak preview uh way to jump into texting with somebody and then asking if you have a kink before you even meet <laughs> Like oh, that's the boy. stuff I'm running. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know how to respond to this. All right. Next question. Let's go. Oh man. Well, you know what? We can move right on from that here too, because we've got that's a lot of free agent stuff to talk about. Right. <laughs> and we go, we, we cut, we cut off that conversation. We move on to the next one. Uh, by the end of our, what we were calling the 2020 season, right. Uh, looking uh, back to the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago, we had gotten to a point where I had talked about this free agent show to come so often uh, that you guys were like, making fun of me for it at the end of it so i am very happy to actually be doing it here today free agent week on the athletic fantasy football podcast we have i mean in recent memory guys i can't remember uh, a time where we had this many big name guys going to free agency now yes of course a lot of these guys are subject to some sort of tag the franchise tag the tr transition tag and so maybe they won't actually hit free agency in a way that we would like to see from just a pure entertainment value standpoint. But still, even with that caveat, just a huge amount of real life stars of fantasy stars of just fantasy, no doubt about it. Starters who could be changing teams. Many of them will be changing teams. And that makes a look at this really fun, even though we know some of the balloon or some of the air is going to be let out of the balloon with some of these guys getting franchise tagged. That window begins today as we are recording uh, Tuesday, February 23rd. As I said earlier, the free agent window opens when the new league year starts on March 17th. So we are getting ready to get into this big free agent class. Of course, Jake has already done this. Jake has a column up on the site right now. Uh, and Jake's column focuses on ideal fantasy landing spots for all the big time free agents we're going to talk about that we're also going to get into maybe more realistic spots for some of these guys we'll obviously um note where guys are maybe not even going to hit the market because they are going to get the franchise tag so we're really going to uh, cover this free agency discussion 
from every conceivable angle. And I broke it down like this, guys, uh, in our show sheet. I have five groups of players uh, that are hitting free agency this year. I have guys who I've termed the stars, the legitimate fantasy stars. And this is a pretty small group of guys. Then I've got the starters, guys who are pretty confident, reliable fantasy starters, the potential starters, guys who could find themselves in a much better position in 2021 than they were last year and be fantasy starters. The old guys, Cam Newton, AJ Green, Rob Gronkowski, guys like that. And then my fifth category is just Mitch Trubisky. Uh, and so <laughs> we will leave it with that, that quintet of groups. And of course, start with the stars the biggest name both real life and fantasy on the market this offseason is going to be Dak Prescott uh, do we really realistically think there's any way in which he is not a Dallas Cowboy in 2021 Jake no because I actually think they're just gonna fran you talk about the franchise uh, they yep. kind of dug their own grave here whatever you want to say and the whole reason we got the Carson Wentz trade is because it's not a bad grave to be in with Dak Prescott no, and it's completely different. You know, everybody's like, well, the Eagles have to do what the Eagles have to do. Well, the Eagles put their own gun to their head. You know, they mm -hmm. they created that situation. They created that problem. So the Cowboys have done the same. If they would have figured things out with Dak two years ago, they wouldn't be in this boat. And then they franchise and they're going to have to probably do it again because if you're Dak Prescott, how do you not command at least 30 million? You know, you see what the market's bearing. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, you see what this team looked like without him and how good he was playing before he got hurt and how good he played back in 2019. So you can't fault Dak Prescott for being that guy. But the NFL has also kind of gotten into this slippery soap situation with the with the quarterback position because one, it's, it's the most important position, but it's gone so heavy into the fact like it doesn't even matter if you're the best quarterback, if you're the next man up. We joked about it, that Stafford was the next man up and then Goff was the next man up. So it's gone so far now that when you're talking about 30 million and you're talking about taking up one sixth of your cap on one player, on one position, uh, it's it's I can understand if screw, you know, forget what the Cowboys did with Dak Prescott and screwed it up. Yep. I can understand why any team would be hesitant to invest that much in one single player, even if there's the most important. So I think the Cowboys are going to fall back and have to franchise because I don't think they want to do this and they have to, if they want to keep Dak and he's not going to want less. So I, I kind of think it's a franchise he's been, but it, all intents yeah. and purposes, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. I right. Mean, right. I think you see how, you know, how much everybody in the NFL team by team is freaked out with their quarterback situation. I was just running through <laughs> mm -hmm. all the teams and you could see anywhere from 10 to 15 teams have a new quarterback next year. And we see how, you know, how crazy everybody is to want to get Deshaun Watson. You can, you can argue that Deshaun Watson is better than Dak Prescott, but they're in a similar tier. And if Dallas has the power to keep that guy and not have to do anything to get themselves in, you know, out there in, in dire straits in the quarterback position, then you do that because it's, you know, for a lot of teams, you can see them, the desperation they have right now to get someone like a Dak Prescott. So if you can, if you have the power to control that, yeah, you lock that up. Absolutely. I, I mean, from a, from a fantasy perspective, we are very happy with Dak remaining in Dallas, aren't we? I mean, I mean go back to 2019 and the superstar year that he had that season last year, uh, as Jake points out in the column, the most points per game of any quarterback. And sure, it was only five games that he played, but we could have been talking about Dak Prescott as the number one quarterback very realistically at the end of the season. He's got all the weapons in the world next year, assuming he stays in Dallas. You've got CeeDee Lamb in year two. You've got a 100% Ezekiel Elliott. You're still going to have Amari Cooper, guys like that. I mean, is he a top three quarterback? If he's back in Dallas, are we talking about him in that group of guys? Is he the next guy after for the, fantasy? Or is he in, yeah, for fantasy purpose. I mean, is he right there in that, you know, maybe not Mahomes, but the next group after Patrick Mahomes? I keep saying so, and I think so. Uh, we did our way too early mock draft, and Funston knows this. I, I thought it was ridiculous that he fell to QB6, and QB6 doesn't sound that low, but I thought that was kind of ridiculous. It w this kind of feels a different version of Tannehill. Like, what more does he have to do to get mm -hmm. the respect? Like, Tannehill, nobody wants to still give him QB1 status. I'm seeing people ask me about offseason keepers and dynasty, and so like Dyn Tannehill, and they don't want to treat him as a QB one, despite two years in a row, Dak Prescott, despite two years in a row being top three and number one, as you mentioned, in points per game before getting hurt, people still don't want to put him there. They want to put everybody else and then put him around five or six. And if you're going to do that, then I'm going to own 90% Dak Prescott <laughs> next year. Well, I guess, I mean, I, I guess I can understand some hesitation because he's coming off a pretty major the injury, injury and, I and that. you know, the running, the running is a big part of his game, but you know, that he's young and we've seen guys come back and, and be just fine after these kind of injuries. So, 
you know, you assume that he's got the best medical attention, you know, is going to be back and be fine. So, yeah, I think he's at least if he's not third, he's 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 in a slam dunk top five conversation and to each their own as to as to how you want to parse that out. Two other guys who uh, I think we would all be very excited to see hit the open market from a pure fantasy perspective. One of these guys, uh, considering my actual NFL fandom, I would not like to see hit the open market. And I'm not sure either of these guys are going to Allen Robinson or Chris Godwin. Both guys are eligible to receive the franchise tag. Uh, you would have to imagine that uh, the Bears certainly aren't going to let Allen Robinson get away, although uh, there's some bad blood between player and front office and totally justified on the player side there. Chris Godwin also feels like a guy who is going to remain with his current team because of the franchise tag. Uh, but let's daydream about these guys a little bit. Like, let's just say something happens, and especially with Allen Robinson, uh, where he just refuses to play for the Bears. He was very much trying to get a long-term contract with the team last year, and they just wouldn't meet him at the negotiating table. What's a great, what's the ideal landing spot, Jake, for Allen Robinson mm -hmm. if somehow he does get away from Chicago? I, I put him with the Raiders. Uh, you know, like, I, as you said, I don't think he gets out of there. I've said it on many podcasts already. To your point, what you just said, the, you think the Bears are going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to be fine with Darnell Mooney and Anthony Miller? <laughs> yeah. No. It, if they can't work anything long term, they franchise him. The only reason he's not on the team is if they franchise and trade. That's the only yeah. way he's not on the team. So I said the Raiders, like, again, you're saying, like, just if he was out there, can go anywhere. And the reason I brought this up is because look at what Aguilar just did. If you can resurrect Aguilar's mm -hmm. career, and Aguilar is nowhere in the realm of Allen Robinson talent wise. And I listed it in the column about 30% of their air yards per target are available. Aguilar had 15.7 target percentage. Allen Robinson had 25.5. But if you look at it, the air yards and the yards per reception were higher for Aguilar than A-Rob for who they're playing with. So A-Rob could go, and because uh, everybody's going to immediately go, well, 140 targets aren't coming with the Raiders. Well, he doesn't need 140 targets if he's playing with the Raiders. And I think that it's a great fit because you put Allen Robinson outside. Henry Ruggs can go back to playing more in the slot like he did at the beginning of the season and then let Brian Edwards develop slowly with the mix of Darren Waller. And you got a great situation there. You could honestly, though, you could put Allen Robinson on about 30 teams. And the only reason right. I'll include like two of them <laughs> is because there's a few teams out there that already have two great wide receivers. And that's the only situation he wouldn't fit in. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I like Tampa's the one of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that would be God wouldn't be exiting then to make yeah. that happen. But uh, <laughs> I like the Raiders because you have a good quarterback and a quarterback who didn't throw it all to the wide receivers last year. In fact, I think Oakland wide res or Las Vegas wide receivers had the second fewest, uh, you know, receptions. And so I think that was Derek Carr falling in love with Darren Waller, but also realizing that he doesn't have a didn't have a go to guy. Uh, we've seen Derek Carr elevate good receivers in the past and Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree. So we know that it's not just a bias uh, for him, but he has to have some talent there. And, mm -hmm. you know, the weird thing would be is Allen Robinson going to Vegas would be like the best quarterback he's ever been paired with. So oh if he has God. an opportunity to control his own destiny and, and the bears let him go, he better not make the mistake again of tying himself to a <laughs> crappy quarterback. Yeah, well, as Jake said, I don't think that's going to happen. I think the only way he is not a bear is if they decide that the relationship is untenable and they tag and trade him. Chris Godwin also feel like he's going to end up with his uh, current team, but I mean, that's, that is not a bad outcome. I think we're, 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 uh, on Godwin, we're in a similar position with Dak Prescott. We're a real life fantasy. We are very happy to see him uh, get the franchise tag and remain with the Bucks. I mean, is there any reason to think that we would want him elsewhere? want him elsewhere uh, i mean it's, I mean, like, it's a little crowded it, right especially if yeah. antonio brown's back and mike Evans and i think crowded. antonio brown if you told me between the two i actually think antonio brown's more likely to be back than godwin just because yes they can franchise him but also you know, we, they said it you know let's bring everybody back well it's the nfl you can't you can't bring right, back him. you can't bring back Gronk. <laughs> yeah. you can't bring back antonio brown you can't bring down your defensive pieces and leonard Fournette or, or you know all this type of stuff your people right, are right. going to be gone so if Godwin is gone, the situation I put is, and I, I, I mentioned this is that why Allen Robinson and Kenny Galladay aren't going to the Giants because the Giants are up against the cap. And I know I've been the one that always says cap doesn't matter. So, you know, it's about cash flow, but cap does matter when you're talking about some of the biggest contracts and being up against it already. The Giants can maneuver, but they're also trying to figure out Leonard Williams. But if you want somebody mm -hmm. who is on their level talent wise, and you're trying to make Daniel Jones a thing, you know, that makes sense for Chris Godwin. You get him a little bit discount because he's missed some time. He hasn't quite become Allen Robinson or Kenny Galladay yet. 
and you put them on the Giants and give them a legit one, and maybe Daniel Jones finally has that where you can slide Sterling Shepard back to number two. He shouldn't be a number one. Let Darius Slayton just be a deep threat. I think the Giants are a great fit, but Godwin's another one. You, you, you tell me 20, 25 teams, and I'm not going to say any of them are a bad fit unless the quarterback mm-hmm. completely stinks, and you can honestly make that argument about the Giants, though. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that at least one of Godwin or, or, or AB stays in Tampa? Is that like a guarantee that at least one of those guys yeah. is back there? Like, if you told me there was odds in Vegas, and I would I would throw all my money down on one of the two staying. Now, if you told me which one to pick, then no, then I'm not <laughs> making that bet. <laughs> Even though yeah. I think it might be Brown more than Godwin. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, 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 don't, I don't expect both of them to be gone but in any way, shape, or form. But I was kind of imagining Chris Godwin might not be a bad play for the Miami Dolphins, who, you mm-hmm. know, with, with Tua there, they need a guy that uh, can get separated. For the time being. For the time being, yes. <laughs> Assuming that, that nothing happens there, but uh, yeah, we can go back to Miami being the best, best, you know, able to make a pitch for Deshaun Watson if Houston was interested in Tua. But right. assuming things stay as as put, like he needs a guy like that that can gain separation. I think Tua is not Ryan Fitzpatrick in that he's a gunslinger and willing to take those risks. And so, you know, a guy like Godwin that can can pretty much put him anywhere on the field and he can find a way to daylight um, would be good for Tua. I What's a fun spot for AB if uh, if Godwin ends oh, up definitely. getting the tag and staying in Tampa? What if what if let's say that's let's say it's Godwin and AB's looking for a job elsewhere? What's a fun spot for him? Mm, well, Juju leaves maybe Pittsburgh. No, <laughs> no. Deontay Johnson, you're, you're duplicating Deontay. You're duplicating my boy. Don't you disrespect my boy on this show? I was show. Um, yeah, something yeah, tells me that real- reunion isn't happening. Uh, the, the real quick, the thing I was going to say was uh, the reason I didn't take, I love the Dolphins one, but the reason I didn't say the Dolphins because that's where I threw Kenny Galladay. So I wasn't going to throw Kenny Galladay and Chris Godwin. Yeah. Uh, Antonio Brown, I mean, he would make sense a lot of places that, you know, you can go back with like Raven situation. I'm trying to look one that makes the most, you know who would make the most sense, honestly? Go pair him with freaking you know, Deshaun Watson's old boy, DeAndre Hopkins. Screw around, stop screwing around with Christian Kirk and all them. Give Kyler Murray Antonio Brown. And DeAndre Hopkins get that Kyler Murray going ballistic the first 10 weeks like he was, and you pair those two together, that head offense would be ridiculous. That'd be pretty fun Arizona to watch. makes some sense, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. what about Houston, who's scorched earth everywhere? They might as well bring in a guy like Antonio Brown, <laughs> pair him with Brandon Cooks if they <laughs> well, lose they Will Fuller. Well, they are. They're bringing back PED, Will Fuller. <laughs> you think they're bringing back Will yeah. Fuller? Is Will Fuller someone who stays? Because he's another guy who is in this free agency discussion who is also susceptible or uh, vulnerable, uh, available to be franchise tagged. Yeah, I think that's. I think he's back one way. Unless they let the show, unless they just blow the hell out of this team and say, "Screw it, we're doing we're, we're doing one of these trades. We're taking three first rounders. Goodbye to Sean Watson." Then there's there's no real reason to bring back Will Fuller because you're gonna have to pay the money whether through the tag or the contract. That's actually why right. I didn't think the. And I know there's a lot of talk out there that the Lions are going to do it with Kenny Galladay and they're trying to work out a long term deal. But that's why I wasn't so sure that that one doesn't even make so much sense in the same situation because. The, we know the Lions are in full rebuild, 100%, even though you traded for mm-hmm. golf, you're still in full rebuild. Like, why are you yeah. going to waste your t- – like, why? I mean, unless you really thought you could turn around in one or two years, Galladay seems wasted there. And I know you don't want to just let a talent like that leave, but mm-hmm. similar to that, like, why bring back Will Fuller on a contract if you're going to trade Deshaun Watson? So that's why, to, to go to that, Beller, actually, in the article, I said Will Fuller should be on whatever team Deshaun Watson is on, whether it's the Texans or whoever he gets traded to. Is that possible? Could they could they include Will Fuller? I mean, how would that have to no, work? No, I was if they thinking more to? like if they let him walk and then they trade yeah. Watson and then he just follows him. That would be like way too way too convoluted of a deal, right? Because they would have to tag <laughs> Fuller and then include yeah. him in a Watson trade that already is going to have a billion picks coming back. Yes, it would yeah, that, it would be that's, too, that's, much, that's too much, too many mechanics, too many moving parts. <laughs> and the NFL right? would have to approve it, and they probably wouldn't even care. They would just be like, "No, we're not even wasting our time." <laughs> <laughs> uh well uh so uh funston uh, uh fuller galladay I, I mean do you think these guys either one of them ends up moving for sure from their original team i mean they're in similar positions right they're original teams that are clearly rebuilding that are almost being stripped for parts that almost certainly aren't going to compete in 2021 that no one would be surprised if we were talking about them having the top two picks in the 2022 draft are either of these guys risks to remain with their team and maybe be held back by their environments? I feel like Galladay maybe more so than Fuller. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think Houston just seems weird that they would they would hold him there and 
you know, I guess it, if they make nice somehow, if somehow this comes comes around that they make nice with Deshaun Watson, I, I agree that, you know, Fuller's going to want to be paired uh, with him. But mm-hmm. in, in the back of my mind, something tells me that Galladay is more likely to stay with the team than Fuller. And, and you know, whatever percentage likelihood that is, I, I haven't quite settled on. But if I was the, if I was the bet between the two who is going to be playing for a different team, I would put my money on Galladay. So where does Galladay? What's a fun? What are we hoping for for Kenny Galladay in terms of landing spot? You know what? I, I was, I was, I was kind of wondering, like, man, with Carson Wentz, the the Colts could really use an alpha, and if they, if you know, let T. Y. Hilton, who's a free agent, go, and they could make some move for like a Fuller or or a Galladay, I think that'd be a fantastic move for them. That would be good. Yeah, could... yeah if not, I said the Dolphins, uh, you know, put Devontae Parker as the number two. No, he can go back to not quite what his breakout year was two years ago now, but he could be one of the best number twos out there. Similar to like, a, I compare it like similar to like a Marvin Jones with Kenny Galladay and, you know, do, do that for the Dolphins. I like that call a lot if it's not the Dolphins, Funston. I think that one makes a lot of sense too. Is I had a tough time finding a great specific fit for the Colts, uh, you mm-hmm. know, assuming that T.Y. Hilton doesn't come back. I actually threw T.Y. Hilton on the Jaguars, like a veteran presence for Trevor Lawrence, mm-hmm. and give him a deep threat alongside DJ Chark with Chenault underneath, and that seems like a nice mix for him. But, Suddenly a fun yeah. offense, yeah. Yeah, the Colts, and also the reason for the Colts is because I went tight end with them. This is just so you can understand my thinking mm-hmm. behind is I went Hunter Henry, finally stopped screwing around with the Trey Burtons and the Jack Doyles and all these other guys. <laughs> Moelle, well, you don't, Cox, think gonna, every... you don't think they're going to mess around with Zach Ertz here? In, in no, I, I, see, Zach Ertz, is, he looked toast at times last year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Hunter Henry could get tagged too, but if Hunter Henry is out right. there, I'd rather the Colts go for him. So if they go for Hunter Henry, I was thinking that kind of precludes them from some of the biggest wide receiver names. But I agree with you, Fonson. If you give, hell, go back to it. Allen Robinson. Kenny Galladay, Chris Guy, wouldn't pick any of them. You put anyone in a, one of those on the Colts with Wentz and Wentz rebounds this time. I, t- I think I told you guys, didn't I tell you in a text? I, I put early, as soon as the Super Bowl was over, I put a little money line bet on the Colts winning the Super Bowl because I had a feeling that Wentz would end up there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that made you feel like that was Super Bowl bound, the Wentz presence. No, but I'm saying, <laughs> like, look, certain, I know I'm, everybody thinks I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm still a Wentz fan. I, I don't I, think I, he's see, done. Exactly. I know everybody's going to say I'm crazy or whatever, but I keep going back to two years ago. Everybody was calling Howie Roseman the best GM in sports, that Doug Peterson was one of the top five coaches. Chris Mm -hmm. uh, Carson Wentz was one of the next top five quarterbacks and one bad year and everybody hates all of them. So do I think Carson Wentz was a big part of the problem last year? Sure. Also look at the receivers he's been dealing with for the past two years and what he's been doing with some of them. You're telling me Philip Rivers can make that team a Super Bowl contender, which it was. You know, it looked great at times, and it just, you know, it didn't click when it didn't click. Carson Wentz, if he gets back to anything he was similar to two years ago, even if he was 80% of that, this team could challenge the Chiefs. They have enough pieces, and they have enough to do in this offseason with the draft and the free agency to fill in a few holes because there's not many left that I think the Colts Mm -hmm. are a serious contender. Think about Philly had allowed 56 quarterback sacks Indy allowed 22 and it's yeah. Philip Rivers, yeah. the most immobile quarterback in the league. It's right <laughs> up there with Tom Brady, right? Like, <laughs> so, you know, that's already a win for Wentz. Even if you want to say a bunch of the sacks were on Wentz for holding the ball too long or trying to do something with it, but it's just a, it's just a, you know, night and day difference in terms of environment for him. And, you know, especially since he's got the familiarity with the coach. So I agree. I think there's going to be a restoration project ahead for Wentz that I feel will be successful. Looking at all these wide receivers, and we've talked about a bunch of them, we've talked about a bunch of different teams. Are we looking at a musical, a game of musical chairs at the wide receiver position? <laughs> I mean, even if we say, so let's just say Robinson and Godwin end up back with their teams, uh, but we've got Galladay, we've got Will Fuller, we've got Antonio Brown, we've got Juju Smith Schuster, T.Y. Hilton, Corey Davis, Marvin Jones, a lot of teams and pretty obvious teams that are going to be in the mix for wide receiver help. I mean, is it just going to be a shuffling? of all of these guys and where like, they're almost like, it's like pseudo trades, right? Like you said, like T.Y. Hilton goes to Jacksonville, Kenny Galladay comes and replaces him in Detroit. Corey Davis goes to Detroit, right? I mean, is it, are we looking at like something like that where it's going to be not trades, but just sort of shuffling, shuffling a very, very nice deck chairs. Probably the team that, you know, maybe, but the team that gets the worst deal is the team that has the worst salary cap, you know, situation so that they may be forced to take, you know, so the the bottom of it and, and whoever's you know whoever's got the best situation could upgrade a little bit but you i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these receivers do 
you know, as you say, have a musical chairs kind of off season experience here. Yeah, I think it could be kind of like a six degrees of separation, though. Uh, so, uh, you know, to go further down my article, but st- like things that make sense. So I said that like Corey Davis would be a great fit for Washington. You know, they need mm-hmm. that kind of wide receiver and he's not one of the most expensive. And also you can kind of count out the most expensive for probably wanting to go there. But he makes a ton of sense. Well, what happens when that happens? Throw Marvin Jones and the Titans, which is sure. a great replacement for Corey Davis. For if Kenny Galladay leaves, throw Curtis Samuel on the Lions. You know, like there's a lot of these that, you know, it might not be a one for one swap, but it'll be if one leaves, there's going to be somebody that replaces them. And it's probably going to be one of the names we're already talking about. The interesting. I love that. uh, Sorry, Funston. I love the uh, I love the uh, Corey Davis to Washington call. Because like he's, he's already yeah. comfortable being like the second guy to someone who is very clearly the number one in front of him. And I just feel like that would really open some things up for Terry McLaurin in that offense. I was just going to say the interesting team here is the Patriots because they don't have a, a free agent mm-hmm. that anybody would care about. But they have a whole lot of money and they have a whole lot of need. Nobody wants for, to go there anymore all of a sudden. <laughs> I know, but money talks and there will be, you know, there will yeah, be the true. Allen Robinsons you know, of the world Who's out there. Who's their quarterback? That, <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's a Jared good question. Ted, Teddy Bridgewater, maybe? We'll, we'll see. <laughs> well, that would involve probably them going and get Deshaun Watson. Then you have to say, well, who's the Texans? Like, see, this is, that's going to create a bunch. There's going to be a hole left somewhere yeah. with the quarterback situation. Somebody's going to be left grasping. For, for that's why we have the Mitch Trubisky section of this, oh, uh, of this sheet of uh, potential free agents. That's why he gets his own section. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's someone else we got to talk about here uh, is Aaron Jones. Jake, you wrote it right in your column uh, that uh, you love Aaron Jones, the player. You're not the biggest fan of Aaron Jones, the Packer. Also someone who could be franchise tag, the running back franchise tag, pretty affordable this season. I don't think it would be yeah. a shock to see the Packers use it on Aaron Jones. I also don't think it's a slam dunk. So, I mean, he feels like the guy who from a pure fantasy standpoint, stands to gain the most by not being back with his current team. Because, I mean, don't we think there's someone out there, there's some team out there that would be willing to give him the workhorse treatment that he just hasn't quite gotten in Green Bay? I would think so. And for my article, yeah, I put him in Arizona. I let him replace Kenyon Drake. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody's going to talk about Chase Edmonds. but And I'm a Chase Edmonds fan. But, you know, we've seen that, like, Aaron Jones, the Cardinal, I know people go, well, how is it going to be much difference with Chase Simmons? Well, it is because Aaron Jones, the player, what I want is I just don't want one week being 10 carries and next week being 20. And give him 16 to 19 touches every single week. Keep him in that range, the high teens, even close to 20. Like, just give him that every week, please. And then I would say top five running back. I just don't want to deal with these 10 carries for 45 yards. And hopefully he gets a touchdown. He is very touchdown reliant. Fortunately, he was in a great mm-hmm. situation for that. So even Aaron Jones, the Packer, if franchise isn't the worst case scenario, uh, the news today is that he wants 15 million a year. So good luck with that. And we'll see if that happens. <laughs> but that's why I actually think when you said that, like the franchise seems like it could happen, especially since Jamal Williams yeah. is a free agent, if they're not ready to just hand it over to AJ Dillon yet. But if you told me, I would love to put him on the Cardinals to replace Kenyon Drake. Just again, give me a team. They'll give him 17, 18 touches every single week, and I'll be giddy. For the first time ever on Aaron Jones, I'll be giddy about Aaron Jones. <laughs> show me a team that's going to give Aaron Jones $15 million, and I'll show you a team I'll yeah. fade. I'll fade you know, <laughs> over and over again because running back can't be a priority like that. Have we learned nothing from the last couple of years? You know? um, so what is the franchise? It's about $8 million or something like that? Is that for right? The ba- for running backs, yeah, it's right in that range. Yeah, and that's why I'm like – you know, I'm as a Seahawks fan, Chris Carson's out there as well. And, you know, there's a lot of talk that he's going to go somewhere else, but I just don't think, you know, that he's going to go out there and find this, this huge mark, especially with Aaron Jones there. And what looks like a really good rookie running back class, right? Like, right. I don't know how much you've dove into it, but there's a, you know, there's Not six, a good one. six at least that look like they can come in and be impact guys right away. So uh, I just don't think there's going to be a huge market out there. Arizona makes mm-hmm. sense for Aaron, Aaron Jones, but all these guys are going to probably have to settle on something less than 10 million a year. In my, my opinion. Yeah. Jake just said another good one too. And and that's, that's, that's going to be big too for these guys, right? We, we have a league that just saw Jonathan Taylor, Deandre Swift, Cam Akers, uh, Antonio Gibson, James Robinson, all these guys have 
you know, immediate success and you can define success however you want to JK Dobbins, another guy in there, right? I mean, you can have different definitions of what exactly immediate success means, but you can't look at any of those guys and say that they had bad rookie years or rookie years where they weren't quite up to speed on what the team needed them to do. And again, they all had to deal with the COVID summer where they didn't have those typical mini camp, training camp, OTA, exhibition games, blah, blah, blah. Maybe something like that will be the case this season. But if it wasn't a detriment to those guys last year, have to think that the league will be in on the affordable prices on draft day for this another good group of running backs in the draft. Um, the running backs that we still have in free agency, Kenyon Drake, Leonard Fournette, Chris Carson, as you mentioned, Funston, uh, James Conner, Phil Lindsay probably not going to be out there. The uh, the Broncos can give him a very affordable second round tender. Have to imagine that he will be remaining in Denver. But we're looking at these guys, especially who stands to gain the most by moving to another team. Again, Drake, Fournette, Carson, Connor. We won't put Aaron Jones in this discussion. Who stands to gain the most, Jake? <laughs> uh, so of the remaining, I think, and I, some people are like, well, the fit doesn't make a ton of sense. And I don't really care because I said the most to gain is you could say whoever ends up on the 49ers. <laughs> I said Leonard Fournette sure. on the 49ers. <laughs> really, because look, Mostert's impressed. <clears throat> Mostert can't stay healthy. I like Mostert somewhat, but I will compare him somewhat also to Jared Goff with Sean McVay. Is it's Kyle freaking Shanahan. The dude is, I don't understand how nobody's figured out this damn family and nobody's figured out how they make every single running back in the history of both of them. And I, that's why I'm including his dad, how they do what they do with running backs because he's made Jeff Wilson a thing. He's made Jarek mm -hmm. McKinnon a thing. He made Tevin Coleman got the best out of Tevin Coleman. So they have no Tevin Coleman. They have no Jarek McKinnon next year. They're down to Mostert and Jeff Wilson. I don't think that the 49ers, whether they draft or free agency, are going to go into next year and say, yeah, we're fine with those two, especially with the injury right. history of Mostert. So I know Fournette's not 100% a perfect fit, but you're talking about Leonard Fournette, who we know at this point of his career is a volume guy. Well, maybe he could be just a little bit more than that if he was under Shanahan. And if you mm -hmm. put anybody, again, I'm saying you put anybody, you put Chris Carson on the 49ers, you put James Conner on the 49ers, just put somebody on the 49ers. But I think Fournette, makes a lot of sense. And I say mostly just any running back that lands with Shanahan is going to gain the most value. Yeah, I, I agree that it's Fournette just because, you know, he's in a he's in a timeshare with Ronald Jones, which won't go away. He needs to go mm -hmm. somewhere. And, uh, you know, it's a very ripe environment in San Francisco. I like that. And I like Jake's call on Kenyon Drake to Atlanta. Just get the younger guy that, that has out there for you. Dual threat there. <laughs> I, that would be that would be a great move for him. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that, that if that were to happen, uh, he'd be a winner for sure. But I, I think Leonard Fournette getting out of Tampa is something um, as much as he likes Tom Brady and the culture there. I think right. I'm sure he likes money as well. And if someone's <laughs> going to pay him, he'll probably go. Uh -huh. He's got the ring now. He's already checked that box. I, if I were him, I would be also looking yeah. for the money and looking for a spot where I could shine as, you know, maybe not alone in the backfield if it ends up being San Francisco, but certainly as the leader. And that takes me to my next question, which is, are any of these guys likely to be sitting as true workhorses to have a backfield to themselves? Maybe Carson, if he stays in Seattle, uh, do we think anyone else is going to go to a spot where, like we were saying for Aaron Jones, just give him 16, 19 touches a week and just let him be? Any of these guys going to end up in a spot where that is the case for them? Whoever ends up in the Falcons. I think, I think if it's Drake or, you know, maybe it, hell, even if it could be Fournette, just whoever ends up with the Falcons is going to be the guy. Mm -hmm. You know, before Todd Gurley got hurt, he was the guy and he was fine. Yeah, his yeah, was I also don't... a little bit touchdown reliant, but – whoever is going there is going to lead in front of Brian Hill and the rest of that backfield. And, you know, again, it, not every backfield leader needs to be 20 touches. It could be 17 mm -hmm. and you're still the solid lead. So I think it's just, you know, you know, why Brandon brought up my Kenyon Drake thing is because Atlanta looks like the best, the clearest situation for a running back to go to. And it was great. I mean, it was, we felt pretty good about Todd Gurley's opportunity and he had it, but he yeah, just, true. We, you know, we didn't feel good about his arthritic knee and that, you know, that kind of bared itself out, but there's no way Atlanta looks at Ito Smith and Brian Hill and says, well, whatever we bring in, we got to make sure we get those guys their touches. I mean, I don't <laughs> think that's going to be a thing. So um, the other thing I would say is if any of these guys were to land in Miami, I'm assuming Miami just addresses this position in the draft. But if anybody were to land in Miami, we know that Brian Flores is a, you know, is a, is a lead dog kind of coach when it comes to the running back position. So you feel good about that. 
how concerned do we think Miami is about the running back position going into this offseason? Uh, I think I don't think they look at Miles Gaskin honestly as their as their running back of the future. I think I think he in in their mind he would be the better Matt Breida, and that you would have him mm-hmm. as the guy that you could you could plug in if you needed to, but it, that they would get more of an alpha uh, kind of guy. That's that's my read on it. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that he's kind of a, a we nice fine good backup plan, mm-hmm. not necessarily you know break in the get last in case of emergency but you know just as we could rely on if we need to but there should be an answer i don't know if they necessarily go first round and they go with Najee harris but you know that would be amazing actually harris or etn uh, you can even make a case for a few of the other running backs as brandon alluded to before if they land in miami just because of opportunity uh, i'd say there's probably about five or six running backs in this draft that could if they're the lead could be somebody that's an rb2 in fantasy and maybe it takes a few more weeks you know hopefully not as bad as taylor and acres and stuff like that <laughs> right. i was just no, gonna say mm-hmm. like the other day i was saying like if if one of these top running backs goes to miami it's not going to be one of these cam acres situations where i'm screaming for the first two months of the season <laughs> it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's gotta happen he's the best yeah. back i i really would expect brian flores to to do it do it right better than sean mcveigh did for sure well and i think that's something too i was i was looking at not to pull in baseball here but you know maybe just something we need to think about more too is we talked about a lot about how no preseason a lot of missed camp and stuff like that how much it was going to play into rookies and players switching teams and there was a lot of speculation and i, I referenced to you guys that brian, brian mcfadden called perfectly how long it was going to take for gronk and that tony brown wasn't going to show up till december but now we've seen cam newton's comments of actually having covid and how worn out he was when he first came back and then you took two months away from yeah. him of learning a new new offense and 200 plays and all that type of stuff. So I'm not, you know, hopefully we don't deal with that this year, but I would just say, put that in the back of your mind, just to remember that if there is a few weeks missed delay, maybe if we only have one preseason game, some of these rookies, some of these guys changing teams, you just remember that when you're drafting next year. Jake said not to pull baseball into it, but I'll pull baseball into it for a second. If any of you out there are also getting ready for your fantasy baseball leagues this year, the guy who fits that mold this season, Yoan Moncada already very undervalued he talked a lot about how much he was affected by COVID so we'll throw a little baseball in there be on the lookout for that in football as well I think Yohan Moncada would be a pretty good football player to be honest with you he's got the build for it (laughs) are we gonna do this now LeBron James and all that type of stuff (laughs) that's right Uh, let's let's uh let's pull ourselves back here to uh to the football world has any player who uh I mean free agency or no uh, this guy will be uh, in this free agent discussion. Has any player lost more stock with his own team over the last two years than Juju Smith-Schuster? I mean, it's crazy, right? <laughs> it, it really is. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for him to I, – look, I, for the past two years, you know, Chris Meany was the first one that even admitted once Antonio Brown was gone that can Juju Smith-Schuster Sh- Juju Smith- be the number one and he, nobody was expecting it to be that bad in the first year. And then, of course, last year, nobody was expecting it to be bad again. There was actually a lot of people that expected a rebound. Uh, mm-hmm. I still, obviously, we have concerns whether he can be a true alpha. But at the same time, I think he can be at least a 1B. And I always used to use An- Anquan Bolden as the perfect comparison. Like, you remember Anquan Bolden's best days with the Cardinals. He was a 1B. And then once he yep. was asked to be the 1A, it kind of didn't really improve his numbers and they actually dropped a little bit at times because there's some that are just on that cusp, but need somebody on their level or possibly slightly better to them across maybe Devontae Parker. You could say that like Devontae Parker's volume two years ago, but like, that's why I bring up like Connie Galladay, put Devontae Parker as a number two and all of a sudden, Holy crap, look out Corey Davis. Another one until, until AJ Brown was a thing. Corey Davis wasn't ready to be a number one. So I bring all that up to say, I think Juju Smith Schuster could find a team uh, if the Eagles had cap space, you know, put him alongside Jalen Rager where you have a talented young rookie that he could play off of or, you know, just put him on a team where he doesn't have to draw that number one attention. And I think he could be a great rebound candidate, especially because his yard, air yards were miserable because of ben, ben Roethlisberger last year. Yeah. And we're talking about I agree. He's not an alpha, but he's a great number two. And we're talking about a guy who was number 19 at the wide receiver position, nine touchdowns, 97 yeah. catches, you know, and he's 24 years old. He came out mm-hmm. so early and he'll be 24 almost until the end of his birthday is in November. So it's, he's basically playing the entire 2021 season as a 24 year old. What I, I would love to go after him in free agency, especially if you can get him at a little bit of a discount uh, as a, as a GM, that would be, you know, a guy I'd be seeking out for sure. 
is there any landing spot that would dramatically change uh, his ADP? Like right now, we're not expecting him to be a break the bank guy, but is there anywhere where we, you could see uh, the fantasy football community in the summer really rallying behind him and pushing him up to a, I don't know, a top 20 receiver, top 16 receiver? Mm-hmm. Looking across the board, and yeah, it's it's like one of those like trying to find the team where because like you got to find an opportunity. And, you know, go back to Miami. That might, although people would just argue back that two is going to hamper him a little bit. But I mm-hmm. think I, that could, I think that could legitimately work. I'll go back to the Raiders, although I think their system doesn't for what they want to do. You already have Waller. You need to move rugs around more. I don't think that's the sure. best fit. The Colts Cardinals? would make actually in the Colts. Cardinals? Put, what Cardinals? Cardinals as a replacement for Larry Fitzgerald. Get him back with, you know, put him, it's just a semi-Eagles thing, just put him with Wentz, just not in Philly. Put him with Wentz on the Colts. <laughs> Let yeah. Pittman play outside, and then he can be the big slot with Paris Campbell out of the slot when he's on the field. That's actually, I think that's a really good fit. Yeah. Is Baltimore going to be involved in all this? I mean, do they, they got to have someone else. Baltimore. Stop. Uh, yeah, uh, I know, but where, they're, 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 fantasy they're, value at the wide receiver position goes to die. They do need, look, but they're going to be involved, right? Some... I mean, they're going to be going after a receiver. I just for fantasy purposes, I don't want to be like they do need somebody. Let's be clear. Like, yeah. I actually think yeah, I still exactly. think that Boykin could be the answer if you would just get like stop pulling him off the field and stop net and letting get, you know, if, I kind of feel like he's not to the level of Corey Davis, but similar to like, you know, let him kind of grow, like stop mm-hmm. screwing around with him. So it doesn't look to me that Boykin is going to be the answer, though. And that's why they brought in Dez and that's why they tried all these other pieces. But they do need somebody. There's no question about it. It's just that offense is going to kill them for fantasy purposes. That's why I'm saying don't put anybody there. What about if it, if if the Titans let Corey Davis walk Juju in Tennessee? I could see that working. That'd be great, too. I just yeah. I hate. You know how I feel. they would have to. I'll say this, Brandon. They need to let Corey Davis and Janu walk. If they bring back Janu, like that, you know this. I'm actually on Janu next year if they don't really address the number two wide receiver. Like if they just say, mm-hmm. oh, we're fine, or they draft somebody, then I'll be on a Janu because he could be the number two. Is I'll go back to what I always say about the Titans. I just don't want a third passing option. Yeah. Is there any way they stay status quo? They re sign Davis and they tag Janu, or is there going to be some turnover in that offense? I'm assuming one of them has to be gone. And I, I just feel, don't I feel need the it. same. It way. just feels like for needs and what they could spend their money elsewhere to mm-hmm. this team. That's another team like the Colts. This is a playoff, if not Super Bowl caliber team. If you just fix a few spots, defense. So, yes, they need a pass obviously. rush. <laughs> they need some playmakers yeah. on the defensive side for sure. You know, there's the yeah. talk about Clowney too. So I'm trying to think. You, you got me looking. I'm still looking through these teams just to see where Juju would fit well. <laughs> The problem yeah. is, is that some of the teams are just, you know, they have no room to make any moves. I know. <laughs> I'm looking at like this team. Yeah, he would make sense there, but uh, no, they, they can't afford it. Or they look at this <laughs> team and they're like, no, no, that's not a good fit. I think what you said, Brandon, Arizona, and then if not Arizona, it, the Colts, those would be the two teams for me. Yeah. I want to get in a couple more questions before we wrap things up and we're getting to the end of our uh, allotted time here. So first question is, are we, are we connecting the dots between Urban Meyer and Curtis Samuel and seeing an Ohio State reunion in Jacksonville at all? I don't – I'm going to go back to – I don't think that really makes sense for their offense because you have Chenault. You can, right. it's, it's, Samuel it's feels like a replicating. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I'll go back to where I think – you also, for me, and I know he's a vet at this point – but that's why I said T.Y. Hilton is I want a vet vet. I want somebody that can yeah. walk over to Trevor that's Lawrence on the sideline and be like, look, dude, this is what it takes in the NFL. Like, you know, some of those videos that we see come out every other week, you know, go over there, be that guy, mm-hmm. be the leader for the wide receivers, be the leader for DJ Chark to next take that next step and stuff like that. And, you know, the good thing about T.Y. Hilton, why I love this fit so much, and it might not even happen, but he was moved around last year as he started yeah. to falter as a deep threat only. You know, these are things that players can teach other players of like where you can take advantage and just, hey, maybe you're not this guy right now, but this is what you could add to your game to be the guy. So I think Curtis Samuel is going to find a great spot. I, I would, again, I'm going to go back to it. Put him on the Lions if they don't bring back Kenny Galladay because you have no Marvin Jones, no Kenny Galladay. The Lions are going to have a hell of a lot of availability for, for targets <laughs> if they don't bring back Kenny Galladay. Yeah. I love that T.Y. Hilton fit in Jacksonville, too, for Trevor Lawrence, because you're talking about a guy who has spent most of his career playing with Andrew Luck and Phillip Rivers, too, right? So he yeah. has had all this time with quarterbacks who he undoubtedly has picked things up from that he could then be the cipher to pass it on 
to Trevor Lawrence. And that feels like just a, a really nice fit. Maybe, maybe he picked up some things from like Curtis Painter too, or, or, or something like that, that he could, uh, <laughs> that would, that, that would stunt, that would stunt the, uh, Devonte Parker, Corey Davis, like breakout of DD Westbrook. But, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah right the next the next guy gonna, that, maybe he's it's, gonna have to westbrook's got to break out for another team i guess he's a free agent as well yeah, yeah. uh maybe kevin white can be that guy uh who, who oh, follows yeah. that uh, year breakout. That, but, um all right last last question i want to get to you guys the old guys let's not forget about the old guys cam newton ryan Fitzpatrick, todd Gurley. feel sad to call him an old guy it's more a body thing than an age thing aj green rob gronkowski jared cook who are we excited about? They're almost all certainly going to be, I mean, maybe not Gronk, but all the rest of them maybe for sure going to be on new teams. Who are we most excited about to see their landing spot, Jake? I'm going to go back to Hunter Henry. Like, even if he gets franchised. Hey, he wasn't, a, he wasn't an option. <laughs> I know, that's... <laughs> oh, I just, I heard you rattling off tight ends and just assumed all is okay. So throw out Hunter Henry. Jared and... No, you can, you can say Hunter Henry. You can say Hunter Henry. It's no, fine. no, no. It's I'll go. Uh, like, look. <laughs> Uh, they're all gross, and you know who I hate the most. But I will say, if there's only you, you said his name, Brandon. If there's a team that could salvage anything left of what Jared Cook's value is, he was essentially touchdown only with the Saints. Where could he go to be that again? The Tennessee Titans, like replace Jono Smith if they let Jono walk. Uh, option, all you want yeah. him to do is score touchdowns. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. all that. That's how Jono's value was buoyed is touchdown so throw him on the titans i'm sure i'll be excited for ryan fitzpatrick for about six weeks next year in a a two qb league kind of like oh this this dollar ryan fitzpatrick that'll be that'll work out i don't know where it'll be chicago maybe who knows maybe it's possible Bridge quarterback he'll be a bridge quarterback somewhere yeah it's definitely possible um all right, you know what? Let's talk about Hunter Henry. Actually, we got some time here. Let's talk about Hunter Henry because he's he could be tagged again. He, the, the Chargers have already tagged him once. He could be tagged again. What what I find it most interesting about Hunter Henry is that we had you know, this big year from Justin Herbert, clearly showing himself to be a guy who can be the guy who can you know, maybe lead the Chargers uh, to a Super Bowl one of these days. Shouldn't have been the M- the offensive rookie of the year, in my opinion. Should have been Justin Jefferson, but whatever. He was uh, he won that award. He won it rightfully enough. And Hunter Henry was just a, a nothing in this offense and seemingly should have had all the opportunity in the world when you consider how much time Austin Eckler and Mike Williams both missed. I mean, does that maybe give us a sign that the chargers are going to be willing to let him walk? You know, it's funny. I'm I serious XM show. I do. We brought Daniel Popper on uh, our guy at the athletic here mm-hmm. uh, covers the chargers. He said, he's a huge priority for the team. Not oh, only wow. because he, because he's, you know, because he's a, for his receiving threat, but he's a really good blocker as well. And uh, they think he's just too important. So Popper didn't expect them to be, you know, even come close to letting him go yeah i i think that everything sounds like he's back but you want to talk about your carousel situation feller and that's what tight end kind of for me it resulted in is like if you put henry on the colts well then the colts as i mentioned you know you throw in somebody else there and put you know titans get jared cook and john who goes to the chargers as he leaves the titans so kind of it's like the same teams that need tight ends probably get the tight ends that move around but henry sounds like he's probably going to be back at this point that's going to be a very fun team, I think, for 2021 as we get into year two of the Justin, Mike Justin Herbert. Era, right? Yeah, Mike Williams could almost certainly going to be gone from there, right? And so I could be a team that maybe they get in on the uh, on the wide receiver game and add someone to what they've already got in that offense. And again, that's going to be, I think, a fun fantasy offense for 2021. And hey, this is going to be a fun fantasy football show for 2021 that we just got started here today on the Athletic Fantasy Football Podcast. Two quick house cleaning notes. Uh, first, we'll be coming at you once a week, every week now until the week before the draft, and then we'll get into twice a week. So every Tuesday, we will have new episodes new episodes for you on the Athletic Fantasy Football Podcast. Also, doing a little bit of a listener survey here at The Athletic. Just want to get an idea into what you like, what you don't like across our entire suite of podcasts. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes. If you would take some time to fill that out, just a couple of minutes, we would really appreciate it. Uh, Jake, Brandon? It's just like riding a bike, just like riding a carousel, right? Just hop right on two weeks off. Didn't forget anything. Uh, Very good to be back with you guys. Hope you feel the same. Ah, It's good to talk football anytime. Absolutely. absolutely. Are we doing this next next week? We are, right? Yeah. Weren't you just (laughs) listening to my house cleaning notes? No, he wasn't. Uh, No, I was not. I was actually uh, (laughs) checking a couple other tabs while you were talking there. My apologies. (laughs) 
All right. Hopefully everyone else was listening. Funston will talk <laughs> offline. But yes, next week, Tuesday, March 2nd, we will be back with a new show. And then every Tuesday subsequently leading up to the draft. And then we change the schedule around a little bit. But you guys already heard that. Funston didn't. Thanks so much for listening in. And hey, if you're on YouTube watching this show as well, we'll be coming at you on YouTube every week the rest of the way as well. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with you next week. Until then, have a great time. We'll talk to you soon.